My name is Christian Hudak, and I am the executive director of the Dunhuang Foundation. Uh, we are currently based in Houston, Texas, and uh, it's a real joy to be connecting with you um, virtually at the moment. Uh, it's been March, I guess, the beginning of March, since I have had an opportunity to really spend any appreciable amount of time with really any person besides my significant other in person. So uh, these Zoom webinars have become an approximation for contact with the outside world. Uh, and it, it's really uh, fantastic to see so many people that are uh, engaged and interested in uh, the content that the foundation is helping to produce. And we are really uh, excited to have the opportunity to share the work of uh, uh, young scholars, established scholars, uh, people from all different uh, backgrounds with you uh, and to give you a better understanding of uh, Buddhism, Silk Road studies, and the other areas that the foundation works in. Um, the uh, lecture series that we are starting tonight is, uh, we're not actually sure how many parts, probably um, between five and seven, uh, that, that will look at various religions of the Silk Road. And our first three talks will be on Buddhism, um, Eric Green, uh, our lecturer for this evening, is going to be giving the first talk. Um, but uh, beyond that, uh, we'll have Susan Huang. She's speaking in January. We've had to move that back. And uh, uh, Carl DeBresny, who is at the Rubin Museum and a curator of Tibetan art, will be speaking on Tibetan Buddhism in uh, December. Uh, Julia will be able to tell you a little bit more uh, when she comes on later in the talk about her upcoming lecture uh, after this, but that will be uh, with Ping Fong, who's a curator of uh, Chinese art at the Seattle Art Museum. So uh, without any further ado, I will just uh, give a brief introduction for uh, today's lecturer, uh, Dr. Eric Green, who uh, is a professor at Yale University. Uh, he is the assistant professor of religious studies at Yale, and uh, his area of focus is uh, really Chinese Buddhism, and particularly the emergence of Chinese forms of Buddhism uh, from the interaction between Indian Buddhism and indigenous Chinese culture. Uh, a lot of his re uh, recent research focuses on meditation practices, uh, but today he'll be speaking about uh, early Buddhism in China and uh, how Buddhism really got to China. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, and I can think of really no better person to uh, give this talk today. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Eric Green. Thank you, uh, Chris, for that introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me to uh, give this uh, lecture on uh, this topic, which is really, of course, very large topic. So uh, what I can talk about today uh, concerning it will be quite small. And uh, just uh, by way of preamble, you know, when I was uh, given the remit for this talk, I was uh, told that uh, I should pitch it to a sort of uh, advanced undergraduate audience, uh, similar to the kinds of lectures I give to my students here at Yale. Uh, but in the, in the weeks running up to this uh, lecture, I saw the advertisement for it circulate on certain uh, scholarly mailing lists to which I subscribe. And I was just scrolling through the list of participants, and I saw some uh, heavy hitters in my own special field of uh, research, including my own dissertation supervisor who's on, on that list somewhere. So I just want to warn all those people who may have tuned in that this is probably not a talk in which you're going to learn very much, and it's uh, uh, really intended for people who don't know very much about the topic or maybe interested in Dunhuang and have been there perhaps and uh, know the art but uh, don't know much about uh, Buddhism or the history of Buddhism in China. So uh, for those people who wish to leave, uh, who know all this material already, I, I invite you to do so. Um, so with that sort of uh, preamble, I'm going to just uh, share my screen here to get us over to my presentation that I've prepared uh, for you. And I will begin, let's see if this works. I think you can all see now. Is that correct? Yes, Chris, anyone? No, let's confirm that this is working. No, fun. Um, it looks great, Eric. OK, great, wonderful. Um, so uh, uh, as uh, I said before, and as Chris uh, introduced the topic here of the sort of the early uh, spread of Buddhism to China, the story of how Buddhism arrived in China. And uh, for those of you, uh, you know, I guess if this is the Dunhuang Foundation, many of you are know about Dunhuang or interested in Dunhuang. Historically, this is, this is really a, a period of time kind of before the glory days of Dunhuang, actually, uh, which sort of begins in the form that we, we see it today, or even the traces of the earliest forms, kind of toward the tail end of this period here, which I've just relatively arbitrarily uh, sort of specified here between 100 and 400 uh, common era. Um, let's see, why is my screen not going far? Oh, here we go. Um, okay, so uh, 
before, before we start and before I uh, start with the things, just a couple kind of big uh, picture overview things first uh, about uh, Buddhism uh, in China and sort of the spread of Buddhism to China and why this is an interesting topic. Again, most of you probably uh, already think it's an interesting topic, uh, but just on the kind of thing that I, I tell my students at Yale, you know, when trying to convince them that this is something uh, worth paying attention to. And, you know, often the first thing I say is that, you know, Buddhism is really the first example we have in China of what we might call a non-governmental institutional religion. So religion in the sense that maybe uh, many of us in kind of the modern West think about an independent institution standing apart from uh, other parts of society uh, and organized in, in, in some way. This is really the, the first example of this we have in, in the history of China. So it, it, it's pretty significant from just that general point of view. Um, and you know, if you really want to stretch even further uh, and kind of make the big sell for why you should pay attention to the history, the early history of Buddhism in China, uh, you would say something like this, which is that Buddhism is um, perhaps, and I would argue this at least, and I think other people might agree, although there could be some dispute, uh, really the most significant uh, source of foreign cultural influence at all on uh, China in, in pre-modern times. I think this is this is a point which other kinds of historians might might want to debate a bit, but it certainly is, if not the most, then one of the most in terms of places where uh, ideas and practices and people also from uh, elsewhere in the world come to China and really uh, uh, change it in certain ways and bring bring with them new ideas. Um, and then uh, my own uh, specialization, if, as it were, within the history of Chinese Buddhism has a lot to do with uh, Buddhist literature, Buddhist texts. Uh, and here, uh, so this is maybe my own uh, particular interest more than anything else, but one major feature of the story of Buddhism's coming to China is the translation into Chinese of Buddhist texts, Buddhist literature, Buddhist doctrines. And this, and this is from a, a more larger perspective in the history of China, a, a really a major event because it's, it's the only time uh, with some exceptions, I'll just leave that aside for now, when a large body of foreign literature is translated into Chinese in the pre-modern era. And in modern era, end of the end of the 19th, beginning of 20th century, when uh, foreign texts and science textbooks and things like that, literature were being translated in Chinese, people would often refer back to the Buddhist translation project as being a sort of a case when this had happened before. But it didn't happen very much. And certainly not if you're you know, someone who's familiar with the history of, say, uh, Europe or, or the Mediterranean region, when uh, texts and literatures are being translated all the time between dozens of different languages. This is not something which, which, which happened. Uh, in, in China, with, again, with the exception of Buddhism. So that's just sort of the big uh, overview uh, before we get, begin. And again, since I'm, many of you are not, of course, specialists in this area, just a quick uh, survey of the you know, major historical periods we'll be talking about here, which I'm, I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with, but just uh, bear with us uh, if you are. Uh, so the, the time uh, that I'll be discussing today really covers, uh, well, I'll just have it here under these four periods, but first of which is, is the Han Dynasty, which I'm Many of you, of course, uh, know, but this is really uh, China's Roman Empire, if you want to, if you want to call it that, in terms of time and extent, a long period of uh, more or less unified rule. Uh, and Buddhism enters China sort of towards the tail end of this period. I'll get into the specifics about that a little bit in a moment. But so that's sort of where we start. Um, and then around 220, the Han Dynasty kind of, I guess, collapses. We would say, and we enter this period called the Three Kingdoms period, when China is divided into sort of competing polities. These are uh, brought back together for this brief moment uh, in a period that's known as the Western Jin Dynasty. And this, uh, this date here of 317, many people consider this to really be the sort of fall of, of the Chinese equivalent of the Roman Empire, because this, this is the moment when the whole sort of north of what we now think of as China is uh, sort of uh, invaded by uh, nomads and things like that. And uh, China enters a period, a, a period of protracted political fragmentation, uh, which we'll just call this the Eastern Jin Dynasty here, or sometimes called the North, beginning of the Northern and Southern Dynasties period. This is where I'm gonna sort of, sort of end more or less today. And in one of the readings I gave you, um, this uh, sort of summary of, of the history of Buddhism in early China by Eric Zerker, one of the great scholars of this, of this topic. Uh, this is when, when he, for example, this Eastern Jin period, when he, when he situates the, the moment when Buddhism really uh, finally begins to sort of take hold and uh, become attractive to a large number uh, of people in China. And uh, if you read that piece, you will also note that uh, he put fo forward a thesis there, which is shared by many scholars, that 
it's really this sort of fragmentation of China in this period uh, that is one of the big historical forces that allows for Buddhism to become established. Uh, whether this is completely, you know, whether everyone would necessarily believe this or not anymore, I'm not, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it as an unsettled question, but there's some sense that the, uh, the period of fragmentation here was particularly um, welcoming to new ideas from, from abroad, uh, and it may have been one of the historical factors that allows Buddhism to, during this sort of 200 year period here, uh, enter, enter China. So that's uh, just basic uh, Chinese history. And then before I really launch into our main topic, I'll, I'll just also give here a quick uh, Buddhism summary, since again, I'm not entirely certain how much uh, everyone here is uh, familiar with it. Just that when I was preparing this talk, I was told that some attendees were excited to hear that uh, Buddhism began in India because they, they didn't know that. So I, I do wanna make sure I cover all the even very basic uh, facts here, just so we can uh, all be some, something of the same page. So uh, Buddhism, of course, as a religion begins in India. Uh, I'll just give the date here of 350 before the common era, which is roughly enough for our purposes. And of course it begins with uh, the Buddha who you see here on the right during his period of uh, austerities. The Buddha uh, is known to have joined or become a renunciate, which was a, a common thing to do in India at the time. Many people seeking enlightenment or liberation through a path of sort of austere practice of some kind. Uh, so he, he undertook that path. There's a story, which of course, I'm sure many of you know, he was a prince and he gave up the pleasures of the palace and all that, but I, we don't need to worry about that uh, today so much. Uh, and again, seeking for, as I said, uh, uh, liberation, enlightenment, nirvana, whatever you want to call it, uh, which, and I'll just mention this, particular point in a little more detail since I'll discuss it again when we get to the situation in, in China. But uh, uh, for the Buddha and the, the, his followers, liberation here is conceived of as, a, as an escape from an endless cycle of rebirth. Again, this is something I imagine most of you have some uh, acquaintance with at least. Uh, but uh, this, when we get to China, we'll see this, this notion of rebirth becomes one of the things that uh, was somewhat novel uh, over there. Uh, and then if, again, this my list here of, of Buddhism, of course, is, is, is very, very brief in terms of what one might want to know about Buddhism, but it's, it's tailored to what I think, uh, you know, are the kind of salient points that we'll want to talk about when we consider um, uh, Buddhism arriving in China and what it may have brought with it that was, that was somewhat new. Um, and so the Buddha quests for enlightenment and all that, and then he have, gathers followers around him. Uh, and this, the technical word here from uh, Buddhism of the Sangha, the community of monks and nuns who were nominally emu emulating the path followed by the Buddha. This becomes essentially the Buddhist church, if you want to call it that. Uh, and again, I mention this because this will be a sort of major uh, novelty of Buddhism uh, in the case of China. And then the, the final point about sort of the basics of Buddhism uh, that we should know about when considering uh, uh, its arrival in China and subsequent development there uh, is in addition to the Buddha and his monks and nuns questing uh, for enlightenment, we have uh, you know, a very important uh, understanding that links the Buddhist community of monks and nuns with the rest of society. And this is this idea of, of merit, this notion that by supporting the Buddhist church through donations and other, other things, um, other people who are not yet perhaps ready themselves to uh, achieve enlightenment in this life, they can acquire good karma, merit, which will help them in their rebirth process and then ensure their eventual liberation in the future. And again, uh, I, I don't know how uh, wise it was of me to sort of think about ways to connect this to the, the topic of Dunhuang, which so many of you are, are interested in. But you know, it's really this, this final point here I mentioned on the basics of Buddhism of merit, this is really the explanation for Dunhuang. If you want one thing that explains Dunhuang, the entire existence of everything you know about Dunhuang, it's, it's merit because this is why uh, it was created, why people donated money essentially. To, to build these fantastic caves and paintings that, 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 that you know about, uh, it, it was based on this notion of, of Buddhist merit. So this is really in terms of the uh, social history of Buddhism everywhere, but in, in the case for us today, China, uh, this is really the, the crucial, um, crucial idea. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, basics of the situation, the history of China where we're gonna be talking about, uh, the Buddhism as a religion, which is, existing at some point. And now uh, sort of the question of uh, Buddhism's, uh, the journey, I don't, if you want to call it that, I guess the arrival of Buddhism in China, let's just say. Um, and just, just to give you again here a, a kind of broad outline of, of what we're looking at in terms of 
uh, the geography and history of the world. Here's here we of course have China, Dunhuang, our, our favorite spot right here out in the west. Uh, here's India again. I, I apologize to those of you um, uh, who for whom uh, this is all uh, material you know, uh, but. Here is sort of central, let's just say central India, northern India, where uh, Buddhism begins. And these, these arrows, this is you, you, the details here and the dates that are listed next to them are not so important. But this just gives you a rough sense of the geographic spread of Buddhism in Asia in, you know, uh, the period. This map here says to, to 600 AD, which is roughly about what we care about now. So Buddhism is, starts here, spreads throughout the Indian subcontinent. By around 100 BC, let's say it spread up here to the Northwest, what is now Pakistan or Afghanistan. And then it's from there uh, that people mostly think, uh, let's just say by 100 uh, of the common era, probably a bit earlier, it has begun to come across here on the famous Silk Roads through Central Asia into, into China. Um, this is this, you know, just if you were trying to sort of visualize in your mind over the long uh, historical period where uh, Buddhists and Buddhism are moving uh, throughout Asia. And just, you know, this route here is the one, of course, that is most uh, commonly thought of as where Buddhism and Buddhists, and Buddhist objects, which I'll talk about a bit more later, how they get to China. I'll just mention sort of parenthetically, there's been long, um, long-term speculation among historians that it may also be possible that uh, Buddhists may have accompanied uh, sea travelers on a route somehow here, winding through Southeast Asia and then entering uh, the Chinese region through the through the southeast here. Uh, this is this is long disputed whether this happened at this very early stage or not. Uh, we're not entirely sure. We do know that in later periods, maybe four or five hundred years later, there was a thriving uh, commercial and other uh, sea trade here between China and uh, what is now Southeast Asia, this region, Sri Lanka. Uh, so we we know that later this becomes an important sort of place where. Um, I'm sorry, I was sh shining my my cursor here on the wrong screen. Uh, here, this this route here. We know we know that later this becomes a very important uh, a route for Buddhists uh, in Asia, but in the early period, uh, probably uh, probably not. Okay, so this is again just a the big uh, big picture visualization for you of of uh, where you can imagine the Buddhists and Buddhist objects traveling across uh, across Asia in this period of time. Um, so uh, now, kind of on to uh, the main topic here, right? The heart of the matter: Buddhism. How did it come to China? Um, if you read the uh, sort of summary uh, by uh, that I, among the re readings that I distributed by Zirko, you'll have you'll have read an account of what is sort of the most famous traditional story of, of Buddhism arriving in China. And just to, to refresh our memory here, because I you know like many stories that endure to the present, it has a certain it's a good story to some degree. And this is the story of the legend of the dream of Emperor Ming. So here are the dates here, 55 to, we're sort of in the second half of the Han Dynasty, as we saw an emperor. Uh, this is long before uh, it's going to collapse, right? In the, in the thriving uh, center of the Han Dynasty. And the, it, according to this story, uh, the emperor uh, fell asleep one day uh, and dreamed. And the story, as the story tells it, he dreamed of a golden man flying through the air, like radiating light. And he woke up and he asked his advisor, I dreamed of this golden man. Who, who, who might that have been? And the advisor somehow has some knowledge of, of, of things foreign and says, I think that may have been this uh, very powerful being from the West known as the Buddha. And the emperor is very impressed by this. And he sends out envoys uh, into Western China across the deserts and then come back with uh, two Buddhist monks, uh, a Buddhist statue and some Buddhist texts. And the emperor is very excited. And he establishes a, a monastery for them. Uh, which is still around uh, today, or some version of it anyway, which bears its name. Uh, and this is the beginning of Buddhism in China. So this, this story is told uh, over and over again uh, throughout uh, the history of China. Uh, its scholars have basically established that it's, it's more or less a pious legend uh, that first appears in the 5th century, roughly. Um, but I, I, I tell it, though, to you, even though it's, it, it's not true, just because it does give us a kind of uh, interesting perspective on how Buddhists in China at a certain point in time wanted to imagine that Buddhism had come to China. And the way they wanted to imagine that it had come to China is that it had been, that the emperor had sort of brought it there on purpose, right? This is a sort of a top-down uh, uh, thing, kind of like Constantine you know, converting to Christianity or something. The emperor decides that Buddhists, Buddhism is gonna be introduced to China. He sends out his, his envoys and it comes and it begins. Um, this is, you know, as we think about uh, the ways that 
when Buddhism came to China, it may have not always been completely welcome at every, at every turn. Uh, we can sort of understand why uh, Buddhists might have desired to have this kind of story, right? It, it establishes a, a link between the emperor of China and Buddhism. It makes it a legitimate presence in China rather than something which, you know, maybe the emperor might have opposed at some point. So there's it, it, a lot of, sort of interesting history we can learn just from, from the existence of this story. Um, and it's a good story for you to, to know simply because it is, it is quite widely told, uh, reproduced in art and various things like that. And if you, so if you Google it on Chinese, on the Chinese web, you'll, you'll still find it told by people uh, as, if, as if it were the true story of, of Buddhism's uh, arrival in China. Quite uh, the, the, the true history, as, as true histories tend to be, um, uh, is a little bit less glamorous. And, and that's that, you know, Buddhism slowly appeared, kind of bubbling up in various currents, maybe monks accompanying traders along the Silk Road, not mandated by the emperor in one big intentional swoop, but through a, a, a less narratively cohesive uh, a story. But there is, you know, we can give it a little bit more uh, uh, coherence um, from the perspective of the, the broader history of China. And this is again, uh, we've mentioned, I've mentioned already the Han, the Han Dynasty, this sort of big uh, Roman Empire-like period of time. And and we do know that there is this moment in in the early Han Dynasty when so here's of course, you know, I can probably. Um, here we have the sort of the heartland of China. There's this, this moment in the, in the Han Dynasty when uh, a kind of uh, uh, imperial or military mission is sent out here into the West. This is, Dunhuang is out here uh, somewhere to, it, to expand and create a kind of like protect, what's sometimes called a protector, right? An area of military control that would uh, insulate the heartland of China from the nomadic peoples to the North who like to invade it. And you see here, this line here, of course, is the, uh, you know, place where the Great Wall was originally built uh, and continued to be reinforced over time. So we, there is this historical moment we know when the, the Central Asian area here is sort of opened up to Chinese presence. And most historians will say now that this, this is clearly uh, a pivotal moment in the story of Buddhism coming to China because it allowed for some kind of communication now for the first time uh, between uh, over here into India and then across uh, the deserts of Central Asia and past Dunhuang, our favorite place. Uh, and into China. So this is this is the the larger uh, historical picture. And again, uh, most people think that probably we had merchants coming, and maybe they were accompanied by monks uh, or something like that. Of course, the details of exactly who and when at this early stage are are, are lost to us. Um, I, I I wanted to just show you that this picture here, kind of giving you the topography of the regions we're talking about. Again, here here is Dunhuang, situated really at the end of this blue line. Here is. Uh, you know, one of the sort of great, so-called great walls of China, as it were, but situated really kind of at the end of that. And then we have this whole expanse here of, of Central Asia and then down across the, the Himalayas in, into India here. Now, um, in the uh, summary of the history of Buddhism in China that I, I gave you to, to read in preparation, uh, the, the, the author there sort of says, well, you know, we could imagine that Buddhism is sort of slowly inching its way across this, this expanse of Central Asia and kind of gradually coming into China. That, that the author of that piece actually, he later revised that theory and wrote what is really a kind of one of the definitive studies of the very earliest uh, arrival of Buddhism in China and showed that uh, this seems not to have been the case actually, that this whole uh, expanse of Central Asia that, uh, that we know about now as having at one point eventually become a real sort of like Buddhist wonderland. There's Dunhuang, of course, you know, but there's many other uh, sites all along the Silk Roads full of uh, similar caves and images and large Buddhist sites were there. But it, in the Han Dynasty, uh, that seems not to have been the case. The area was probably not uh, densely enough uh, populated to support um, Buddhist uh, temples or, or monks and nuns to any serious degree. So it sort of looks like actually what happened is traders kind of traveled this long distance and then plopped down uh, here in China with uh, information about Buddhism or Buddhist monks, uh, Buddhist monks, uh, that kind of thing. So long distance travel, uh, which is, again, I, I mentioned this only because uh, so conclusions that the author of that piece gave ended up being a bit different than that. So, um, uh, and, you know, since again, uh, you are maybe familiar with uh, Chinese Buddhism from a place like Dunhuang or something, this, these are sites which develop uh, somewhat later than, than the story we're telling here. So it's not, if you're thinking about it, it's, it's a little more complicated than the sort of slow march across uh, Central Asia. 
So um, again, the, the details of Buddhism's arrival, uh, we, we cannot know for sure, but we have certain sort of snippets of historical information that give us a kind of nice little picture. Uh, this is uh, this record here, one of the earliest written documents to record uh, any sort of Buddhist presence in China. This is from a historical text roughly around the year 50, uh, where there's some record of uh, the king of Chu, who was basically like a prince, sort of a local ruler of a local region of China. Uh, it was said to have uh, recited the subtle words of Huang Lao, who was a kind of a deity of some kind, and respectfully performed gentle sacrifices to the Buddha. So there's just a sort of passing reference here in this Chinese historical source about a, about a ruler. So this is quite high uh, level sociologically of Chinese society, making what is called here a gentle sacrifice uh, to the Buddha. Uh, the gentle sacrifice probably here means a, a non-meat uh, sacrifice, so like a, an offering to the Buddha as a, as a kind of god, but not involving uh, a meat in the way you would normally sacrifice uh, to a Chinese spirit. So this, this clearly uh, shows some sort of um, presence of something Buddhist happening here, and again, at, at a very high level of society, but uh, it's quite piecemeal, right? Again, just to sort of contrast it with the story of, um, of Emperor Ming, um, which has the emperor sort of intentionally setting out to bring Buddhism to, bring Buddhism to China. We've got no, no information of Buddhism at all. And then suddenly, oh, some ruler is, is making a sacrifice to the Buddha. Uh, another a similar example, again, if we're just looking at historical written sources for Chinese history, uh, this from a, a court poem written, by, written around 100 AD, describing the emperor's harem. That's the, well, the topic is the, the, the capital city and all of its splendors. Uh, and in his description of the emperor's harem, this, this court poet just lets it slip and says, even a Buddhist monk would be captivated by the, the, the women of the harem. Uh, now, this is a quite uh, interesting uh, uh, reference because it, it, it shows us, well, firstly, that someone writing court poetry uh, would expect his audience to sort of know who Buddhist monks were and more to the point, know that they weren't supposed to be captivated by the, the women of the emperor's harem. Right? So clearly by this time now, we're in the later days of the Han Dynasty, uh, Buddhist monks were, were, were around uh, somehow uh, in, in China uh, and knowledge of them had, had, and their practices to some degree had, had, had reached a certain level of society. Um, so uh, from the, around this time, as I said before, this is really when historians will situate the beginnings of Chinese Buddhism from around 100 or 150 uh, AD, a, gradually, uh, a gradual increase in number of times Buddhists are mentioned in historical sources. Uh, we have translations of Buddhist literature, which begin to survive, which I'll talk about in a second. And then um, material evidence of Buddhism in China in terms of images and objects. And I have the sort of end of my presentation, I have a number of examples of those uh, that, that I want to show you. Um, so uh, again, the, you know, I, I, in a short one hour lecture, obviously even in a whole semester's worth of lectures, uh, the whole history of, of Buddhism and Early China is not something we can really cover. So just you know, for the purposes of, of my talk today and what I'm gonna speak about from going forward here, just in the time I have, um, I, I think you, know, you can think about if you want, uh, if you were trying to think about where Buddhism became important in China, what were the, the main features of the Buddhist religion that uh, whose presence we note that stood out or where things happened. Uh, you know, if you wanted to, you could divide them and just, again, I do this sort of heuristically, three areas, let's just say, right? One idea, one area would be uh, Buddhist thought, right? Buddhist ideas, doctrines, and then the Buddhist um, texts and scriptures, the holy uh, writings of the Buddhist, of, of Buddhist religion where these ideas are contained. This, this is one major uh, feature or one aspect of, of the early history of Buddhism in China. Uh, the other, uh, I would say, would be the Buddhist institution itself. And by the Buddhist institution here, I really mean um, uh, the Buddhist monastic institution. So monks and nuns uh, and uh, the clergy as a sort of a sociological phenomenon. Uh, and then the third thing, uh, we would say perhaps uh, the material aspects of Buddhism, images, temples, caves, the sort of the way that Buddhism established its presence in a physical way uh, in the Chinese landscape. Now, each of these, again, these are just three sort of categories that I sort of came up with, have, you know, and not just me, of course, but, uh, you know, for the purpose of presenting this topic, and really each of these things you, you could tell the history of um, uh, on its own, right? Each of these has a history. And, and of course, they, they connect in, in certain ways, right? Like the, uh, the Buddhist institution of, of monks and nuns is connected to uh, 
certain ideas and doctrines about you know, what's, what monks and nuns are for, what they should be doing, why you should support them. That kind of thing. So obviously these are not completely uh, separate things, but just as a way of organizing our thoughts about uh, the arrival of Buddhism in China in its early history, this, this is a sort of a, a way we might do it. Um, and again, I'm just gonna, um, I wanna just uh, say now, you know, uh, some uh, features of each of these three areas uh, that we might, uh, uh, we might think about. Uh, in this, in again, it, just in this early period, uh, and I'm not going to be completely strict here with the, uh, with with the history. I want to mention uh, aspects of these three areas, uh, which uh, we note from early on, which become important, and then of course uh, I mention them because they may be things that uh, have a long-lasting influence on the history of Buddhism in China. So um, this first area that I sort of signaled out here, this Buddhist doctrines, Buddhist literature. Uh, Buddhist texts. Um, so one, you know, uh, if we were considering this in the, uh, say, uh, history of Buddhism itself uh, and its uh, journeys across Asia and travels and spread to other countries, the, the case of China from that, in that story uh, is, is interesting and significant uh, in this area of, of, of doctrines and literature, um, precisely because, as, as you of course know, uh, China, in a way that many other places uh, at this time did not, had a long history of indigenous uh, writing, right? So that when Buddhism arrived in China with its you know, scriptures and holy texts, uh, it had competition, let's put it that way, right? There were Chinese holy texts of a certain kind that already existed. And there was, um, you know, a, a pretty strong belief on the part of uh, the educated classes of society that those, that those uh, teachings uh, already contained most of what um, one might need to know. Uh, in the uh, summary of the hi early history of Buddhism that I, I had some of you, or you may have read uh, the piece by Eric Zerker, um, uh, you will have uh, read, he highlights there, uh, let's just call it the uh, kind of conflict, right? He highlights the idea that uh, Buddhism was, uh, had, certain aspects of Buddhism were resisted by certain forces in China. And this, and this, this uh, feature of it here uh, was one of the ones that he highlights, right? That, uh, that the, uh, the lack of, the unwillingness on the part of many people in China to accept uh, uh, new teachings because of the existence of this established uh, scriptural literary tradition, maybe some things associated with Confucius and stuff like that. Um, I think just, I, I think this is true and, um, uh, I'll we'll look at a passage now from that other document I gave you to read uh, where this is discussed. Uh, I will say though that, you know, the, how much conflict there is, is this is also something that, that, that scholars do debate. Um, and the conflict that uh, uh, we do find, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily uh, the same at all levels of society. So uh, the, the rulers of China, the people in the highest uh, strata who were maybe, um, you know, revered Confucius and his teachings, uh, they may have, some sort of resistance to the idea of some other foreign uh, enlightened sage, but you know, uh, the average people on the street that may have been completely not an issue. So just to, to, to point out that that is something to we might think about. Um, so again, this I, I one of the the documents I had you read was this very early um, polemical treatise, right, in which a defender of Buddhism is uh, uh, responding to a critic, uh, and this is one of the passages. This is the text that you read from about 250 AD, we think. Um, but one of those passages here, just to, to highlight this theme here of, of the resistance to, potential resistance to the Chinese, to the Buddhist uh, scriptural teachings because of the existence of competing Chinese traditions. This, this passage here that you read here, right? That the way of Buddha, uh, of the Buddha is, how could it be so good given that it's not contained in these ancient Chinese texts uh, that we have? So th this is an objection we see very early on, again, from this text from 250 AD. Uh, and it is one that you know, comes up again and again in the history of, of Buddhism in China. You will see uh, critics say that, uh, object to it on, on these grounds. Um, and so this is you know, one reason why the uh, translation of Indian Buddhist texts into Chinese uh, may have been um, such a, uh, an important feature of the spread of this uh, spread of Buddhism in China, precisely to create a kind of uh, 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 a written canon that could uh, hold weight against uh, what already existed in China. Um, just to say a few things about this is this is a topic that I myself uh, do a lot of work on the early translation of Buddhist text into Chinese. 
and I'm very interested in it. Um, so just to sort of you know, get, say a few things about it, this, beginning around 150, this I, date I already mentioned, we begin to see Buddhist texts translated into Chinese. Again, this was uh, uh, the first time this had really happened in the history of China. This, th this was really an enormous project if you look at it in the sort of perspective of history, right? Um, hundreds, thousands of texts over, over hundreds of years uh, were translated into Chinese. It was really an ongoing uh, a project of intercultural translation. Um, and as I said, it's notable in the history of China because this, this is really the only time uh, in the history of pre-modern China where such a huge, or really even any substantial volume of foreign literature gets translated. Again, there are some exceptions. There's Nestorian and Man Manichaean texts later on and there's Catholic texts uh, when the Jesuits come in the 16th century, but nothing, nothing comparable to uh, the Buddhist translation project. Um, and if you are interested in the history of Buddhism more broadly in East Asia, this is very significant because it's the Chinese translations of Buddhist texts that become the Buddhist canon for all of East Asia. So in Japan, Korea, in uh, Vietnam, uh, when Buddhism eventually spreads to those countries, um, just like say in you know, Europe, Latin becomes the church language of all of Western Europe. Uh, the Chinese uh, Buddhist texts, Buddhist trans the Chinese translations of Indian Buddhist texts, these become the scriptural language and they are not then later translated into Japanese, Korean, or Vietnamese, right? It, they, they remain in the, in the form of the Chinese translation. So this really becomes the, 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 the collection of Buddhist scriptures in all of East Asia. Um, and as I said a moment ago, uh, culturally this, this gives to Chinese Buddhism a sort of a, a cultural weight uh, in the eyes of, of, well, that's the intention at least, or the hope, uh, in, compared to other uh, traditional Chinese uh, Confucian uh, practices. And uh, finally, just to say uh, very briefly, and this is not something I'm going to talk about at all um, any, anymore today, but the, the translation of Buddhist literature into Chinese becomes hugely productive in many other areas of Chinese um, of religion, Taoism, uh, many other uh, Chinese popular religion ideas uh, uh, and uh, figures and tropes that we find within Buddhist literature sort of spread well beyond uh, the domain of Buddhism and really become part of Chinese culture uh, as a whole. Um, I, I know that uh, I wanted to I have a lot more images to show you going in the second part of this, the rest of this talk, uh, just to start with this. This is um, on the theme of the Chinese translations of Buddhist text. This is the uh, earliest manuscript that we, we know of, of a Buddhist text in, in East Asia. Uh, this is uh, dated by a kind of uh, uh, record here to 296 um, uh, AD. And it was found uh, in, in this, Place called Turfan, which is a bit west of, of Dunhuang, but in, in Central Asia, or sort of uh, whatever you want to call that region, um, preserved because of the of the dry climate there. Um, and this is this is a uh, one of these sort of early translations. Uh, this is actually the, the colophon here, or the sort of notice tells us about this. This this is the copy was made just a few years after this text was translated by one of the most famous early translators uh, who was living sort of in the late in the late third century. Um, this this is also just uh, an interesting object. Uh, for two other reasons. One is because this is the oldest piece of paper in the world that has a date written on it. So I think there, there are uh, pieces of paper, the paper was of course invented in China, and there are, there are sort of pieces of paper that we have that we can date a bit earlier than this based on sort of other features like how, where they were buried or things like that. But this is, this is the oldest one with a date on it and it's got a, a Buddhist text on it. Um, and the other interesting thing about this is that we don't actually have this object anymore. This, this was found uh, in this place of Turfan by um, uh, a team of Japanese kind of travelers uh, in, the, in the early 20th century who were out there. Um, and they brought it back to Japan uh, and it was held in Japan for a while and then it kind of disappeared. We don't really know where it is, unfortunately. So we have, we have some photographs. There, so. Anyway, this is, this is the earliest um, piece of paper with a date on it. It's a Buddhist, Buddhist translation, Chinese translation of Buddhist text. Um, and, you know, this is, of course, there's other examples of, of Buddhism's connection with uh, uh, the reproduction of, of texts in East Asia. This is, you may be familiar with this document, again, just on the theme of Dunhuang, since that's uh, the connection that all of us have here today. Uh, not just the, that was the oldest piece of paper. Uh, and this, of course, is the, the oldest printed document in the world, which is also a Buddhist uh, a, a sutra, a Buddhist translation from an Indian text. This, was, this, this one was actually found uh, at, at Dunhuang. Um, uh, this is much later, of course, 868 AD. Um, so uh, Buddhist literature and the translations, that's uh, that. 
I, I do want to say also now, you know, uh, something about um, uh, Buddhist doctrines and ideas and beliefs a little bit and their early arrival in China. I will just say a few things about this and really limit myself to this one topic of karma and rebirth, right? Uh, I mentioned before in my sort of brief summary of Buddhism that this was a sort of central feature of uh, Indian Buddhist understanding and not just Buddhism in India, all many other forms of Indian religion, that human beings are trapped uh, in a cycle of rebirth based on their karma, their deeds. Um, this, uh, it's, it's clear from many, many sources that this is one of the uh, doctrinal uh, features of Buddhism that was uh, most significant um, when, um, for the early acceptance of Buddhism in China. Um, there were, uh, you know, another in that article by Zerker that I had read, perhaps, uh, he makes some comments there about how, you know, before Buddhism, the Chinese were you know, uh, a practical people and they weren't concerned about life after death, you know, after life, things like that. That's a, a, something of an overgeneralization. We, we certainly know that uh, before Buddhism came to China, uh, there were ideas about death and the afterlife and things like that in China. But compared to the uh, systematic and very elaborate theories that Buddhism brings with it in terms of rebirth and karma, there, there was really nothing quite like that. So it, it does seem that one of the reasons that Buddhism uh, was seen as interesting and attractive uh, in China was because of its very uh, thorough accounting of uh, the process of the afterlife, uh, what impacts one's state of rebirth uh, and that kind of thing. Um, I, I won't go into the details here since this now you have to take a class or read more about Buddhism again. Many of you probably know these things, but uh, in addition to simply a generic notion that you know uh, you are reborn according to your karma, Buddhism has many very concrete ideas about this, about the different realms you can be reborn in, the various heavens, that you could be reborn as an animal, that you could be reborn in hell as a hungry ghost, also not a great uh, not a great place to be reborn. Um, so there, there, Buddhism brought with it a quite elaborate accounting of the afterlife. And within the, the texts that were translated, the stories that were told by missionaries, um, th this is a major feature of, of, of the earliest forms of Buddhism in China and a major reason why it was um, uh, attractive. Um, I, I always just, you know, when talking about the spread of Buddhism in China, I, I always show these pictures to my undergraduates. This is, th these are actually Japanese. Uh, paintings, but the the stories of you know the the, the fates that await the sinners in hell, uh, in Buddhist hell, these are uh, you know, we find these everywhere, uh, from the earliest translations of Buddhist text to Chinese uh, to paintings like this. This is again the Japanese example, but there were plenty many like this. It happens to be well preserved. Here we see these sort of uh, demons in hell uh, taking these uh, poor people and putting them into some kind of meat grinder here coming out the bottom. Um, so this, 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 this imagination of the afterlife and of, and of why you might need Buddhism to help you avoid uh, the bad fates. Uh, here are a, a particular hell for people who, uh, you know, leather workers or something here now in, in hell, they're skinned by the demons and all that kind of stuff. So this, this, this clearly was uh, a productive of a huge amount of both artistic work and also you know, written literature about these things. So again, there's many other uh, features of, of Buddhist doctrine that we could we could discuss uh, and, and and their arrival in China, but I, I won't do that uh, because I want to say now a few things about these two final topics that I mentioned. One is the Buddhist monastic institution, right? Uh, and again, I think this is uh, in sociologically in terms of uh, bringing with it a new mode of social organization. This this was probably the most significant or novel, let's just say, the most novel aspect of Buddhism relative to. Uh, what already existed in China. The notion of an independent organization of men and women who had uh, left their families and existed apart. There was, there was really nothing quite like this uh, in China before Buddhism. And this definitely is an area where, um, you know, the, the idea of conflict between Buddhism and traditional Chinese uh, society is, is very real. When I, when I teach Buddhist, uh, Buddhism to my students at Yale, I always show them this picture, um, which is of a, a monk begging on the side of the road in, in Taiwan. Um, and I, I like this picture because it's a Buddhist monk begging. And then we, we see here this, his, his ID card showing very prominently. And this of course is his government registration because if you wanna be a Buddhist monk in China, you need to be registered with the government as such. And th this, this uh, accommodation between uh, an institution that wants to be apart from society and the desire of the Chinese government to 
thoughts throughout all of time to sort of the nervousness that it felt about that idea. And this is something we see uh, reflected from very early on in the history of, of Chinese Buddhism. So within uh, that uh, uh, reading that I gave you, some of the early critics of Buddhism, we see already these, these criticisms of the idea of monks and nuns living apart from the rest of society. Uh, and this is, a, a, again, one of these perennial themes of, of Chinese Buddhist history, and, and, and definitely a point of, of tension uh, and, and conflict. Uh, this is you know, from an image from the Cultural Revolution when uh, many uh, Buddhists and Buddhist monks and nuns were, were forced to return to lay life in China. But th this is something that happened uh, much earlier in Chinese history as well, just kind of, and the first examples begin at the end of the period that I was talking about today. So around the year 400, uh, where we have the first examples of, of, of the authorities saying, you know, uh, we're not so happy with this separate institution of, of monks and nuns and, and, we, and we would like to stop it in some way. And, th and this happens uh, periodically throughout the history of China. Uh, this is the, the text you read, the sort of critics of Buddhism here. Uh, this, this was maybe the passage uh, most, most relevant to that, uh, where the, the critic uh, is suggesting that monks and nuns, uh, who, or in this case, just monks, is what it says in the text, rejecting their children and families, that this is uh, somehow um, unnatural or a contrary to the way that society uh, should be organized. Um, so the... This, this is a, if, we, if we're telling the history of the early period of Buddhism in China, but really the whole of the history, this, the story of the, the gradual establishment of the monastic institution uh, and uh, the tensions that that created, this, this is a major, uh, a major aspect of that. Um, I'm got, I'd like to uh, skip, I had a few more things there, but just in the interest of time, uh, the final uh, area in which, uh, so the final story, let's just say, of, of the early uh, arrival of Buddhism in China, all sort of group here under this uh, heading, Buddhist material culture uh, in China. Um, and again, I, I, I wanted to dwell on this a little bit uh, in part because I know that uh, the, the Dunhuang theme, many of you, this is something that you're probably quite interested in. Um, uh, again, just to return to our, our map that I showed you before, uh, in this early period, 100 to 300, uh, as I said before, you know, Dunhuang and all of these other sites, Torfan, Tazil, these sort of many uh, dozens and dozens of very famous uh, Buddhist sites along the Silk Road, filled with images and objects and things like that. Uh, in this early period of the years 100 to 300, none of these really um, are here yet. Um, we don't have any evidence of, of large scale uh, buildings or uh, artwork uh, from these regions in this earliest period. Instead, uh, we, they, we have stuff that shows up in central China, uh, in the Southwest in Sichuan, uh, in the North and here in the Southeast. And like many of the other uh, sort of examples that I read to you before, these sort of casual references to Buddhism in a history where a sacrifice is made to him or a court poet talking about a Buddhist monk, the, the first Buddhist objects that appear in China it's, are, are similarly piecemeal and, and difficult to interpret uh, uh, exactly. This is a, um, uh, a, a Chinese tomb from somewhere, around, let's just say around the year 200 from uh, Sichuan province in the Southwest carved into rock. Uh, these are sort of the chambers in the back here where uh, people would be buried. And this, is, um, uh, this tomb is, has typical carvings and imagery on the side that we find in other Chinese tombs, Chinese um, uh, gods and other imagery known to be associated with the Chinese funerary world. But what it also has, and this is why I'm, I'm showing you and why it's famous, here above one of the doors, we find what is maybe the earliest uh, Buddhist image of a Buddha uh, in China. Um, kind of closer look up from it here, right? And it's, uh, again, it's in this tomb, which is not, doesn't really give us a sense of being Buddhist in many other ways. But here's the Buddha, just sort of uh, hanging out, unmistakably so, right? And this is the, the form that a lot of these, these earliest Buddhist images in China uh, take, uh, appearing on objects, in tombs, uh, and, and um, a somewhat uncertain inter interpretation. Uh, this object here, this is uh, what uh, Chinese archaeologists sometimes call a, a money tree. It seems to be some sort of auspicious object that is again also found in tombs where a lot of uh, objects uh, find. We find that there's many examples of these. They all look a little bit similar. This one here though, right along uh, 
again, this is also from around um, second or third century tomb, uh, right along this sort of top part, this copper top part, we have a couple images that again, uh, if we knowing Buddhist imagery, uh, we can see quite clearly that here, here is the Buddha in some form. Um, and what, what, what he's doing on this particular object is again, uh, not entirely certain. Uh, from Southeast China, sort of around like Shanghai, Nanjing, that area, uh, there's another kind of interesting object that begins to appear in the third century, also in tombs. These are sometimes called uh, soul jars. Uh, there's some theory that this is a place for the souls of the deceased people in the tomb to sort of congregate or something. No one really knows what they're for. I should just say that's a kind of term archaeologists apply to them. Um, they're all a bit different. They look frequently sort of this basic shape. And some of them, as you see here, um, have little Buddhas around the tops of them. Uh, other ones like this, this is another example which doesn't have the Buddha, but they often have uh, uh, humanoid figures around them. And again, we don't know what these were, what they were for, um, but this is another place where again, in tombs, which is quite quite interesting, um, images of the Buddha begin to appear. And this is again, third century uh, in South China. So this is in the same period that we know from other sources, historically, uh, translations of Buddhist texts, references and Buddhist historical, and, historical sources, Buddhism is around in some form in here. Now it's showing up in the material record. This is another example um, of another, another one of these jars from a tomb with kind of Buddha on it, also third, third century. This is a quite interesting one, again, also from a tomb. Uh, many Chinese tombs from this period we know but would often contain small little replicas of buildings and houses uh, from and that sort of copies of things uh, that exist in the world. This one uh, from a also a third century tomb. Uh, this is sort of a Chinese house of some kind, but this object here and what scholars have been interested in this one is this top. If you know what, uh, if you've seen sort of Buddhist stupas or pagodas, this, this part on the top here with these sort of um, little uh, disc-like things this is very distinctive. This is, this is clearly architecturally derived from uh, the way that Buddhist uh, stupas uh, look like. So this, this shows up again. This is another one uh, kind of just a belt buckle of some kind uh, with, with some sort of uh, figure carved on it with, again, showing clear Buddhist iconography. So these, uh, uh, one more, and then I'll just say something about them. This is, a, this is the back of a mirror. All of these objects were found uh, in tombs, like I said before. The other side of this mirror was, this other side is a smooth uh, metal surface that would be polished as a mirror. But the backs of these mirrors, again, which we find many, many examples of them in Chinese tombs from the second, third century, often had um, images or like this carved on them, very elaborate, intricate. And you see here and, and here, um, again, some figures which are kind of unmistakably uh, Buddhist in their, in their iconography. Now, uh, just you know, to, to say here, uh, th these images and objects have been a real interest to historians because they show us uh, Buddhism to some extent in China in this time in, in various configurations. But, but what they meant, uh, it's, really, it's really not so clear. Uh, and we don't really know what these objects were used for. Um, uh, and whether the people who were using them, what they thought of the Buddha, you know, you can't really tell uh, just from these objects alone. Um, maybe the most we can say is that it shows us that the Buddha was clearly at this point uh, known as some kind of powerful being. This again is another passage from that uh, text I gave you from 250 AD, where uh, the Chinese author is describing to his, the person what the Buddha is. Right? Shadowy and indistinct, the Buddha transforms the different bodies. He wants to travel, he flies, he emits light. So this, this image of the Buddha as a powerful foreign god, this, this is clearly spreading uh, throughout China uh, in some form or another at this time. I just have a couple uh, of more final slides to show you because we do, in addition to these sort of um, piecemeal objects of uncertain interpretation, we do begin then slowly by the third century to have uh, what we might call proper Buddhist icons, things that look more like the images of Buddhas that we're familiar with from later times, and which clearly uh, must have been used in, in, in acts of, of ritual and worship to some degree. This is, this is the earliest one that we know that has a date, a firm date, uh, because it's carved on the back here in this inscription uh, to uh, 338. This is in the San Francisco uh, Asian Art Museum, and it's quite small, it's about 16 inches tall. Uh, so these were sort of small uh, bronze uh, images, and they start showing up um, in the third and early fourth century. There are many examples of them found in museums all throughout the world. Uh, uh, and this, this now gives us maybe a different, uh, maybe shows us that Buddhism is, is now uh, existing in a different way, right? Something closer to what we would think of as the real Buddhist religion with 
uh, Buddhist images that are, that, are, that are being used in their more normally expected ritual forms. Here's another example. Again, these are all quite small. And compared to the, if you're familiar with the other uh, sites in China, Longmen and uh, Datong, these cave sites with these huge carved Buddhas, this, this, is, this is nothing on that scale uh, quite yet. This is, this is just, I have two more final things and then I'll wrap it up here. This is another one of these images uh, that we find in China. This one actually has um, Indian writing inscribed on the back. So it's, it's clear that uh, many of these images were, um, or at least some of these images were not, were not made in China, but were, were being transported uh, uh, in, some, in some manner across uh, probably the Silk Roads in Central Asia. Uh, and just to, to my, my final image here, this, this is maybe one of the most famous of these, of these early Buddha images. This is in, the, uh, in, in, in Boston. Uh, and this one, you know, for a long time, people weren't sure whether this was made in China. There's been some recent work which shows based on the casting technique, this, this is definitely, even though it was recovered in China uh, in a, a, a fourth century tomb of some kind, or maybe even earlier, I can't remember precisely where this one was found. Uh, th this was made not in China, made in India and was brought uh, brought across. So uh, that's, uh, my timing is relatively good. I've kind of reached the end here. So just again, to, to, to conclude my, my, my three areas that I, I wanted to, to give to you here about Buddhist text and Buddhist doctrine, the Buddhist monastic institution and Buddhist uh, material culture and images. These, by the end of this early period, uh, around the year 400, these are all established in a form that, though not identical to uh, what would come later in Chinese history and still not yet, uh, at the level say, that we see it do, uh, they, they are there in some incipient form. And this is really the, the beginnings of the end of the beginning, we, we, we could call it, of, uh, of Buddhism's arrival in China. So thank you uh, for your attention. And I guess we have um, a period now of some uh, question and answer. Yes, thank you so much, Eric, for that incredibly illuminating presentation. Um, I learned a lot. So can't thank you enough for giving us such a great perspective on the transmission of Buddha, Buddhism from India into China. Um, we have some questions, <laughs> quite a few. Uh, to begin, what are some of the misconceptions people have about the differences between Buddhism as practiced in India and as practiced in China? What are some of the misconceptions people have about those differences? Yeah, the misconceptions. Well, that people I suppose the, the misconceptions have no limit. There could be any number. <laughs> <laughs> are there um, some salient examples that come to mind? Well, I, I, I actually, this is, this is probably not the answer that um, people are looking for, but I, I actually think that, um, that for, there has been a misconception, I think it is a misconception to think that, you know, Buddhism in China is really that much different from Buddhism in other places. I think this, this is, you know, uh, for a long time, I think, uh, among historians, now again, I don't know if this is a, mis again, this is, I can't quite judge the, the question because I don't know if it's meant misconceptions in the popular world or among uh, ordinary people or among like scholars of, of, of the history of Buddhism. But in that later category, I think, you know, the idea that somehow China is so, is so unique in its uh, cultural history that, that Buddhism in China has to be, has to have evolved into something very, very different. I think that's actually kind of a misconception, and that, especially so, you know, in terms of the topics I, I brought up, this idea of the Buddhist monastic institution, right? The monks right. and the Sangha. Um, you know, to, 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 I think to a certain extent, this is as, as a living religion, that's kind of the heart of Buddhism. And that, is, that appears in China, you know? Uh, and we, we have Buddhist monasticism in China in a way that is, uh, you know, pretty comparable to, how it exists uh, in, the, in the rest of the world. So I think that's a, so I think it may, it may be something of a misconception to think that uh, there's some undefinable Chinese-ness to Chinese Buddhism that you know, we're, we're gonna find. That, but again, I, that, that may not be the, the, there may be many other, I'm sure there are other misconceptions. That seems like a pretty salient one to me. Yeah. But that, 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 that's, a, that's possibly a idiosyncratic reply that, um, other scholars such as myself would disagree with. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we have a very specific question. What are the earliest dates of a Buddhist cemetery in Dunhuang that can still be seen today and is still open to visitors and archeologists and were foreigners on the Silk Road allowed to be buried in the same cemetery? I, I don't, you know, <laughs> that's a really good question. And I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know either. Yeah, I, I really, I really don't know. Uh, the, you know, the, 
there, there, there are a couple in Dunhuang. I'm actually not sure about what kinds of cemeteries at Dunhuang have been excavated. I, I should say that, you know, um, I am not a, so there is a, you can, you can be a Dunhuangologist, you know, and I am not a Dunhuangologist. So uh, I, I'm happy to attempt to answer questions you might have about that, but uh, uh, I may not be the best person. I, yeah, so I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know about uh, the early cemeteries at Dunhuang. Yeah, the cemetery that's the most famous is the one that has Chang Shu Hong in it, like the first director. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that with his stupa, but I'm not so sure about other cemeteries. So I do know there were some bones yeah. found in certain caves. So yeah, 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 there are. And um, but yeah, I, 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 I know who to ask, but I don't, I don't know the answers to those questions. That's actually a, a, a big part of it. If you know who to ask, you can get away with knowing everything. That is very true. Well, we'll hold on that one. So thank you mm -hmm. for, the, for the questioner who asked that particular uh, question. Um, we have a thank you for your lecture. The architectural model with the Buddhist feature is very interesting. Which mm. tomb is it from? Um, yeah, let's see. I, I have a note. I would have to let's see the the one with the little stupa thing. I guess is the um, yeah. That's from a place called. That's from a. I think it, what's the name of it? It's called. It's not, it's 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 place in Hubei. Oh, okay. Yeah, called Xiangfang Cheng. I, I I don't I don't know. I I don't know I don't know I can't tell you I'm afraid I can't tell you more about that site, uh, other than to say that it's it's considered to be a a, a third century tomb. Oh, okay, yeah, it's fascinating. I've never seen an image of it before. Yeah, that's it. I I actually I actually saw that for the first time not that long ago either. Uh, and there, there, there are some little, there's the sort of pagoda-like top, and then the, right. the, there's a close-up. There's actually some other little figures on there that people think are. Um, oh, that's fascinating. Sometimes, you know, you, you do often see uh, archaeological reports come out where someone's, oh, I found the new Buddha image, and you look close, and you, eh, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not quite so sure about that. So, but that, that one, the, the top, to, to me at least, the, the, it was quite amazing. But you know, a lot of these tombs, I, I should say, you know, they're, they're not so... The dating of the tomb itself, uh, mm -hmm. objects are often dated only by the tomb they come out of. And then how you date the tomb is often more complicated. And you, know, you read the archaeological report and they say, this is a third century tomb. And, you, and, they, and they say, I know it's a third century tomb because it looks like other third century tombs. And you go, oh, okay, I guess you're the archaeologist, you know, um, but it, it can be. It can be you know, that can get a little trickier. Like, like the library cave at Dunhuang, even dating anything is just so complicated because... A lot, the, the library cave at Dunhuang, at least there, you know, uh, yeah, at least you have text on the inside with the dates. And you know, like, okay, the last dated text of a, of a certain time. So there's some, we, have, we have some nice uh, things like that. Some tombs, sometimes there's no, most often actually, there's no sort of written dates. Or anything like that. So no way to tell for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question about cave systems. Were cave systems like Dunhuang and Kucha present in Gandhara in the first century BCE? I, I, so, like, were, they were certain, we definitely certainly have caves, uh, like monastic caves in India, in, let's say the Indian right. subcontinent in the right. first century BCE. Um, I, I'm going to not go on record saying specifically about Gandhara in the first century BC. I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not entirely certain when the first caves is in it. But that the sort of, the model of caves that this is coming from India, this, this is absolutely certain. Um, but again, in the, you know, the period that I was speaking about today, we don't really have caves yet, as far as we know. Uh, again, the dating of the caves in Central Asia is also not completely without controversy you know often we have right. the paintings you can uh, even there there has not been as much kind of carbon dating of specific paintings as you know, maybe there could be but even there you, you can maybe date the paintings but that's different from say dating the excavation of the cave itself um, okay. but there are other historical sources that really suggest that we, we don't have those kinds of major, major sites but it is it, it's certain that um, monastic cave complexes sort of cave complexes as, as dwelling places you know, mm -hmm. as places where monks and nuns would live. And then right. also as um, sites of sort of patronage. Right. And this is essentially a place like Dunhuang mm -hmm. and, and, and Kucha as well. This, this is what they become. They become places where donors can give to the Buddhist church and, you know, 
increasingly um, elaborate uh, artwork, let's just say, uh, can get created on that behalf as a, as a means of generating uh, merit. So this this that model of a of a of a Buddhist object we we, we certainly know is coming is coming from India and is uh, certainly inspired by precedent uh, there. Right. Okay. That's fascinating. Um, I have a question. Has there been any research into the purpose of early Buddhist art in China? Can I ask you to go out on a limb and speak to whether early Buddhist art in China, in any sense, was it didactic or did it play a role in Buddhism spread? Mm. So, um, yes, this is the, uh, the danger of the written questions is I can't, I can't follow up with the question or to ask for clarification. So I'm not sure if the, if the question is referring to the, the kinds of images that I showed. Yes. If that's if if that's what is meant, or like Buddhist art in general. So I think so. Just I'll I'll speak about the objects I showed. So you know those cases. I think um, it, it it really is, and I it really is kind of a mystery. So the I think you know the the analogy I like to think of is like it's possible that they're just like you know how like when you go to Home Depot and you buy like plants for your garden, sometimes you can get like a stone Buddha. Yes you know, like a garden Buddha, right? So it's like, and like you sort of know it's a Buddha. I mean, maybe you all know more than that. And then you'll say, oh yeah, they, they know it's a Buddha and they get it and they put it in their garden, you know? But it's not, so it's like, it's an object, it's a thing that's known, but it's not like, but it's used in a way that's not like obviously connected to the Buddhist religion. Right. So this, this is an argument that many people have put forward about some of these objects that I showed you, like the sort of Buddha on the belt buckle or this mm. thing. On the other hand, most of them come from tombs and you know we know that tombs are these are these are important places right you don't just put like random Whatever. stuff in, in a tomb yeah. right you you are you're putting objects that you will ensure the, the happiness and prosperity of the souls of your ancestors and things like that so that 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 these buddhas would be in the tombs suggests at least some connection to a, a nominally religious association but it's very different from the, so the second set of objects i showed you the actual buddhist icons Right? These look like images we know from India. They look like images we know later. And these, these are clearly objects designed to be what, what Buddhist images are normally for, which is you know, worshipped. Right? They are right. the Buddha. You, you bow to them and make offerings to them, used in those in sacrifice, you know, what they were called sacrifice. So I think from the objects, we can make that distinction, we, we can mm -hmm. say. So the icons, certainly. Um, I think, you know, obviously, Buddhist art always has the potential to, to be didactic, right? You, know, right? you can always hold up a Buddha and say, well, here, let, let me teach you about Buddhism by showing you this object. But, you know, Buddhist icons, certainly, we would normally say their primary function is as ritual icons to some degree. Uh, they, they have power, right? They're, they're, they're imbued with the divine-ish, divine presence of the Buddha that is, can be, you know, powerful in some way. So that's, I, I, I think most, most scholars will, will, will say that's the primary purpose. And didactic oh. purposes, you know, are always possible. It's always available as an option, but you know, it's not say what they're designed for in that sense. Not the primary purpose. Yeah, I mean, that's. I, I think that would be the, the 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 standard answer. But again, just to you know, uh, we don't like people don't write these things down so much. Mm -hmm. I will say so that that image from the San Francisco Art Museum, San Francisco right. Museum of Asian Art, they do. Okay, I, I say they don't write things down, but they do write down something. So often. When there's a dedication on the back, they say, right. I've I have made this image and made the merit generated by making this image right. be used for purpose X, Y, or Z. May it be used to benefit my parents mm -hmm. in the next life. So that so the production of the so we do know that the purpose of the production of the image is often merit is almost always actually merit generated. Right? And then, uh, it's one, one reason I stressed in my talk the kind of merit angles, um, because that really explains or is, is, is a primary cause for the production of so many of so many Buddhist things, objects in the world. So Buddhist art, the production of it frequently, you know, the, it is actually stated that's why it's for. But then, of course, what the object itself is used for is, is a potentially different question. Right. So the object takes on a life of its own within its lived context. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I know these are not some of these questions are quite complicated. Um, when Buddhism arrived in China, was it mostly Mahayana Buddhism? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, the, the usual answer to that question will be yes, it's it's mostly Mahayana Buddhism. And then it, some, the follow-up answer will usually be yes, all Buddhism in China was usually Mahayana Buddhism. I, I think the real answer is quite a bit more complicated than that. So right. just, as, just as an example, um, the first translator of Buddhist texts, someone area topic of my active research this person who we know or this team of people we don't know starting from around 150 the year 150 is translating texts almost every this person translates texts or their team translates texts for 20 years and we have like 30 or 40 buddhist texts that survive chinese buddhist texts translations from India. all these texts are like not what we normally think of as mahayana texts right so i think you know um as a matter of self-identity uh, Buddhists in China always called themselves Mahayana. Mm. You know, they always said, "Oh, we are followers of the Mahayana." Um, but you know what that what that would have it wouldn't necessarily have meant to them at every moment what we in the present might think of as Mahayana, because in the present moment we say Mahayana, we often mean, "Oh, we're contrasting, say, Buddhism in China or Buddhism in Tibet with Buddhism in, say, Thailand or Southeast Asia." Right. And those are those are modern divisions, right? So whatever. It's not really the same thing as was meant back um, in, you know, in, in, in China in the early days. So, as, so again, the title Mahayana was definitely a self-professed identity for almost all Buddhists in China from the beginning. And Mahayana literature, like the, the, the Buddhist scriptures and sutras associated with Mahayana, arrive in China very early. So there's that first person I just mentioned, who for some reason, all, his, all the texts associated with this translator are not, not, not quote-unquote Mahayana texts. 20 years later, there's someone who comes and translates a bunch of Mahayana texts. So from the very, from doctrinally in, in, in Chinese Buddhism, from the beginning, Mahayana literature is there. It's accepted as the word of the Buddha. This, if you wanted to make a distinction between Mahayana Buddhism and something else, you might say, well, there's certain parts of the Buddhist world where certain texts are not considered to be real Buddhist sutras. Okay. Mahayana texts. Like, so if you, go to, if you go to like, you know, Thailand and you bring the Lotus Sutra to Thailand and say, this is the word of the Buddha. They say, that's not where that, that's not oh. the word of the Buddha. That's, they, they wrote that later. Um, so, and so, so if you, if you, if you divide Mahayana from non-Mahayana in terms of who, you know, believe, you know, reads or, you know, is interested in these particular texts, in China, they, they always were. So from that, from that perspective, it, it was always. Mahayana. So that, that's, a, I, I try to just complicate. So the simple answer to that question is yes. Uh, Self-designated Mahayana yeah, Buddhism. And this is more complicated um, answer, which you know, that's, my life is going on. that's excellent. Thank you. Oh, we have some illumination too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Enlight enlightenment is here. Enlightenment is dawned. It, it, it's 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 the um, uh, um, fluorescent bulb which kind of goes in and out. It's, yeah. Oh, I like it. Um, we have. What did the uh, when did the assimilation of Buddhist ideas begin, or did it happen at all? I assume this is in China. And I assume that by assimilation um, means, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, what is meant in, in a question like that by the word assimilation, I think is, mm -hmm. is, is an interesting question. I mean, one, one thing it might mean is, you know, when do ideas which we as a historian would want to say these come from Buddhism, when do those kinds of ideas sort of escape from the confines of a right. purely Buddhist self-identity and sort right. of uh, begin appearing in other things in China? And, and this happens quite early. So, you know, um, by the probably late fourth century at the very latest, um, we have, uh, I didn't, I sort of alluded to this in one line of my presentation, but, you know, the emergence of the Taoist religion in China, right. um, which happens, say, rough, let's, around the same time that Buddhism is appearing and becomes a sort of a, a, a competing organized clerical religion uh, in, in, in later China. Uh, we know, lots of texts and scriptures associated with Taoism begin appearing in the late fourth century that look very Buddhist or they seem like they have a lot of, they're clearly, they're clearly borrowing a lot of Buddhist things. Now, what they're doing with them is a different question. It doesn't mean they're just like copying Buddhism, right? They're right. often taking Buddhist ideas and repurposing them for their own reasons. So again, like this idea of um, karma and rebirth. So the, the, the Buddhist vision of the afterlife as uh, rebirth in various potential realms, um, and all this kind of thing. This, by the fourth, fifth century, this is now becoming not just a Buddhist idea anymore in China. This is, and I, if, if that's what we mean by sort of assimilated, um, this, this is now entering into a wider, wider thing. And then maybe by the eighth or ninth century, it's even outside of Taoism. 
and eat and to, and to this day, of course, if you um, go to what is often called a sort of a temple of popular Chinese religion, sort of a non-denominational Chinese temple, um, you know, they will they will express ideas about about karma and the afterlife that um, you know are very again we, we can't really call them Buddhist because they're not Buddhist, but clearly in the sort of the long perspective of history, you know, came from this interaction between. Um, you know, Buddhist, Buddhist ideas and Chinese ideas starting again in the fourth century. So I would say by the, by the fourth century is when we, we begin to see this happening um, in a way that just keeps getting more and more as time goes on. You see more and more of a Buddhist inflection in popular religious beliefs. Uh, yeah, again, I, like finding the vocabulary to talk about this is, is tricky because if you say yeah. it's a Buddhist inflection, you're sort of, you know, you're implicitly evaluating it in terms of, you know, fidelity to, you know, some notion of, um, Orthodox Buddhism or something. And that's, you know, as, as, a, as scholars and his, but at me as a historian, you kind of don't want to do that necessarily. But uh, it's clearly something that, 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 is, um, that could only have come into its form that it did come into because of Buddhism having come to China as well. I see. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, th our next um, visitor wrote, thank you for a very interesting talk. May I please ask why the gilded bronze image with the flames emanating from the shoulders of the Buddha that you showed at the end of the slideshow, mm. um, why is it likely to be from India? Thank you. It has to, so it has to do with the, um, uh, uh, the different techniques of bronze casting. Um, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say this, I, I, I saw a presentation this very recently by the curator of Asian art here at Yale. Uh, so if I say this, like I might, I might screw it up, but I believe my, so, you know, uh, that bronze casting technology in China was a modular. Right. And, and um, in India, it was like whole piece or something like that. And like they did, she, she, she organized some sort of like um, x-ray something. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sounding like very knowledgeable here. So I, <laughs> as I tell you about this, but they were able to look kind of inside the image and see uh, whether it was a modular, cre a modular construction or not. Mm -hmm. And they were able to see, that, and they were able to see that it wasn't, okay. or I've got this reversed, and it's the other way around. But <laughs> they were able, they were able to actually see how it was put together, and in that, and and, and prove that it, it was not cast in China. Okay. Which was kind of... It wasn't using like lost wax casting methods or whatever it was right. at that time. Yeah, that that's right. Yeah. Now again, um, this this is this this is the was recent research by our, our curator here. Uh, so the. Uh, this this may be contested at some point. I, I don't. I'm not going to. I'm not going to speak to that. That's fascinating, though. Like I hope. But the image, you know, it's very. You know, with, with the with the mustache. I mean, certainly visually, people have yeah. long suspected that it was not um, made in um, in China. And actually, you know, I had. It's actually really interesting because I had my own. Uh, I should go back to it now. I had my own. Uh, I'll, I'll share this with you. I had my own, I had actually long thought this because you see, you see the hands here, you see how, so th this, this Buddha is in the meditation posture. Um, and if you, if you look, you can see that, that, that his right hand is resting on top of his left hand. Mm -hmm. And what's quite interesting is that, you know, in Buddha, so the, uh, some of the early Chinese images, you can't quite tell because they have, so actually here's a, here's a good, some of them you can't tell because they're um, the the hands are kind of flat, and this is probably and like this one here, right? And this is probably because you know, having sort of loose open hands is 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 harder to do with the casting and all that kind of stuff. Um, but later images in China, it's always it's always the left hand on top of the right hand, and uh, when you look in manuals for like this is my own area of um, expertise, the manuals for Buddhist meditation written in China, they always say put your left hand on top of your right hand. But Indian Buddhist images always have the right hand on top of the left hand. So I remember seeing this image many years ago and looking at it going, you know, that's really weird that the, that the right hand is on top of the left hand. So I was like, it must be, it must be from India. I didn't have any you know, proof of that. So I was quite happy to see that, like, see that oh. study. We have a few more comments about that image as well. <laughs> Some people oh, did yeah, chime it's, in. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's of course a very well, well known image and it, there could be people on this. Um, um, webinar you know more about it than I do so I'm, I'm not Shreyman wrote that. according to the curatorial notes published at Harvard Art Museum's website the Buddha statue you showed at the very end of your presentation 
was made using the piece mold casting technique, which indicates the Chinese origin for the object. I wonder if you've read anything contradicting that, because no. if I heard you correctly, you said the piece was made outside of China. So here we go again. It's a similar question. Yeah, well, so uh, I, I, you know, it's, I, I may have this backwards. So I, if so, I apologize. But again, I, I, I sh probably shouldn't have incorporated something I just heard in the talk like two weeks ago. Ignore the art historians are coming out with their pitchforks. Lecture. So, so yes, please, art historians, uh, do your pitchfork thing. Uh, you can take it up with, with, with Denise Lighty and uh, you can tell me if, I, if I've gotten this backwards. It's a fascinating field for further study. I think we can all agree to agree on that part, at least regarding the statue. Mm. Um, oh, we had a question. Uh, your implication is that Buddhism first came along the south, southern, okay, along the southern rather than the northern Silk Road. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, I, I don't think that we know, like, so if, if south, southern, northern, like northern talk, north part of the desert or south part of the desert in Central Asia, I don't know of any evidence one way or another that would tell us, like, we're, ta we're talking like, you know, Han Dynasty here. I'm not, sh I'm not sure that we know. And again, part of the reason we don't really know is because there isn't any like data from that region in that time for Buddhism, right? And this, this notion that Buddhism is kind of coming in this um, uh, long distance travel, right? That it's actually not coming from Central Asia, but it's coming from say further West India, uh, Parthia or whatever, these regions. And then caravans are going across the roads. And, and whether those caravans are taking the Northern or Southern Silk Road, I, I don't think we know that. Right. Um, it's possible that there are some records that show like some people going north rather than south. Uh, but it, in, in the earliest time in the Han Dynasty, that's not, a, again, because, the, because Central Asia itself does not appear to be uh, particularly well settled yet at that time. Again, that's, but this is a, uh, I, please don't, again, uh, don't quote me on that completely because I'm not, this is a Silk Road Studies is another one of these, you know, things when you, where you can, uh, that can be your thing. And it's not, that, that also is not quite accurate. Okay, we will not quote you on that then. <laughs> <laughs> don't, in fact, don't quote me on any, on anything, please. Okay. We have one final question, um, mm. which is, what did early Buddhist practices in China look like? What did early Buddhist practices in China look like? Do we have an idea of what they might have? Resembled? Well, so, uh, I mean, so one way to answer that question is, you know, uh, is the evidence that, again, the, the sort of some of the evidence or some of the material I was presenting today. So like, for example, um, the translation of Indian texts into Chinese was clearly part of Buddhist practice. Right? Uh, so, and, and we know that was part of Buddhist practice because we know it, we know it happened. The creation of images, we know this was to some degree part of Buddhist practice. Now, if the question is, you know, in third century China, if I go to a Buddhist, te Buddhist temple, you know, what are people doing? We don't really know what that is like. Um, there is, a, uh, I, didn't give, I didn't read it to you or show it to you, but among the very early um, these sort of scattered references of historical sources, so there's a, a court poem talking about you know, Buddhist monks getting distracted by the women of the harem. There's another one uh, which comes from a later source, uh, but purports to describe events from around 190 and it's describing events of a sort of regional ruler or warlord. And it says that he sponsored a giant Buddhist festival of bathing the Buddha. And oh, he okay. invited hundreds of, and he, they use the word for upasakas, which means Buddhist laymen, or lay women also, uh, to come participate and, and fed them. Now it's a little, so what this means is we don't really know either, but there's a clear description here of a, a large, temple of some kind that could accommodate maybe hundreds of people and this uh, rituals of bathing the Buddha this this is a, a ceremony that we know Buddhists do in later times where you take an image of the Buddha and you can pour water over it to wash it um, often various sort of explanations for what's going on there uh, so this, this 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 is our probably earliest historical description of a kind of Buddhist ritual clear a clearly Buddhist ritual thing the, the story of the emperor or the king making a sacri sacrifice to the Buddha along with some other gods. This is perhaps a kind of Buddhist ritual, but it seems like it's not a maybe fully Buddhist ritual because the Buddha is just one god among many. This thing from 190 uh, AD, uh, this, this, this appears now. We have, a, we have a Buddhist ritual tradition of some. One thing I'll just um, say that we don't, are not entirely certain about is um, when uh, there were Chinese Buddhist monks and nuns, 
nuns, so, you know, the, that other text I had you read, the lives of the nuns detailing sort of some of the early Buddhist nuns in China, this, that, that um, collection purports to describe the first Buddhist nuns, which come in the early 300s. Uh, but the question of the earliest Buddhist monks is not entirely clear. There are some uh, later records which say that in the beginning, the Chinese rulers prohibited uh, native born Chinese people from becoming monks, and okay. that all of the monks in China were foreign, were foreigners uh, for maybe 100, even 200 years. This, this is, there's a story that says this, and whether that's true or not, we're not entirely certain. So we don't really know uh, what, what even the communities of people would have completely looked like. Uh, uh, it's kind of, for a while, Buddhism was probably mostly a religion of foreigners in okay. China, like traders coming across the Silk Roads, maybe, but also maybe, you know, their second and third generation descendants in China who might have been partially, you know, acculturated to some degree. We're not, we're not entirely certain about that either. So, but again, on this, just to cue back to that earlier question of sort of misconceptions, et cetera, I think it would be, on the one hand, you don't want to assume that Buddhism, you know, has always like been the same or that it's the same in all places. On the other hand, you know, I, I personally don't see any real reason for not thinking that the Buddhist practices would have been pretty similar to Buddhist practices that we know from all Buddhist cultures. We you know, would have had temples and ceremonies of, you know, making merit by making donations to the church and worshiping the Buddha in some form. I mean, some of that would have existed uh, almost certainly, but uh, it's, it's all a bit, uh, apart from the things I just said, we don't have a whole lot of other concrete evidence apart from the objects themselves. And again, the, the existence of those icons starting from around 250 is, is clear indication to say that you know, now you have Buddhist worship in a kind of recognizable sense. Right, they're producing sophisticated icons and there's other forms of religious practice that are definitely going on. Oh, okay, Eric, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending this evening. Um, I know that there's a lot happening, uh, especially in the US later this evening. So thank you for spending this time with us. Um, we greatly appreciate all of you um, just joining us. And um, I, first and foremost, I really want to thank Eric for sharing his knowledge on this understudied period in uh, Buddhist history. Um, I have to admit, even after studying this for many years myself, I didn't know a great deal about the very early stages of Buddhism in China. So, Eric, we cannot thank you enough. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for it. having me. It was um, fun. And I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to join us again uh, on November 19th. That is also a Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. We will have, as Chris mentioned earlier, Ping Feng. She is the curator at the Seattle Asian Art Museum. And she will talk about a sutra manuscript in the collection that she has, um, she successfully has traced the provenance back to the library cave, Cave 17 at Dunhuang. So that promises to be quite fascinating. All right, so uh, thank you again, everyone. And I wish you all a very good evening. Good night. Thank you.